My name is Alan Sands, and I'm sitting outside the Asian Centre at the University of British Columbia. Welcome to the Global Politics Instructional Video Series. In this series, we are looking at a series of concepts and ideas that are important to the study of global politics and international relations. And today, we're looking at free trade. Now, what's interesting about free trade is today we think of free trade as a very natural thing because there's so many free trade agreements and free trade areas around the world. But the reality is, is that free trade is not some natural thing. It's not something that just happened. Free trade was built. It is a built, constructed thing. Uh, today we think of it as very natural, but in fact all of the free trade that goes on in the world today, uh, trillions of dollars changing hands every single day, billions of merchandise goods in value circulating around the world every day, all of that happened because it was allowed to happen. It was built. And free trade then is all about removing barriers to trade. And barriers to trade exist because groups and countries decide to put up barriers to trade to protect their own economies. Free trade implies a lot more trade across boundaries, across barriers, and between societies. And obviously this can be very threatening because some individuals in a society may not feel that they will benefit from free trade or they may even lose their incomes or their jobs. Meanwhile, others may be champions of free trade because they think it's a wonderful idea. The whole idea of free trade is built on the principle that if more people are freely available to engage in mutually beneficial exchange, that this will mean that the world's resources are used more efficiently, that more people will become more wealthy as a result, and that countries can specialize economically in what they do best, what they produce most efficiently, and then trade around the world for all of the goods and services and resources that they don't uh, produce most efficiently or that they don't have easily available to them. It's this process of specialization that's so critical. And economists refer to this as comparative advantage. So the whole idea of free trade is to build a world in which there are fewer and fewer barriers to trade, hence the term free trade. So let's take a look at how you build free trade in the world. Free trade. Now, the whole objective of free trade is to reduce barriers to trade. And this requires states to reach agreements on measures to promote trade between them. So let's take an example. I'm going to draw a picture of three countries. And for now, we'll just call them A, B, and C. And these three countries trade a lot amongst them, and they've all agreed that they'd like to trade more. And so they sign an agreement. And this agreement between the three of them we'll simply refer to as the ABC trade agreement. And in this agreement, as in all trade agreements, these countries are agreeing to a number of policies that will promote trade between them. The first of these policies is to reduce tariffs. And tariff reduction is actually very important. Uh, it's the most important part of all trade agreements. And what this is all about is, let's say, country A produces product X and exports it into the economy of state B. Now, state B will have a tariff on that product. And a tariff is simply a tax on a product as it comes in to a country, as it crosses the border. And that tax might be anywhere between 25% or even higher in some cases, uh, all the way down to perhaps zero. But in this case, let's say the tariff is 25%. Now what that means is when product X comes from state A into the economy of state B, its cost 
is the original cost of production plus profit plus the tariff, the cost of the tax. So that tariff is passed on to the consumer in state B, and that makes that product a lot more expensive than it would be otherwise. And that means the citizens of state B are less likely to buy it. And that means trade is interfered with, it's interrupted, it's it's uh, reduced because fewer citizens of state B are going to be willing to pay for this product at that additional cost. So tariff reduction means that the cost of this product, X, will be lowered and that means more citizens in state B will buy it and are therefore more likely to purchase larger quantities of it and therefore that will stimulate trade between state A and state B. The second way these countries can reduce uh, trade barriers between them is to eliminate or reduce non-tariff barriers to trade. And non-tariff barriers are things like quotas, uh, export subsidies, uh, licensing requirements, and so on. If you can reduce those, then you will be in a situation where you will promote trade. Third, all of these countries will probably agree to put into place some kind of non-discrimination policies in, in between them. And the whole idea here is state C may also produce product X and export it to state B. And the principle of non-discrimination says that state B then cannot treat this product this X product from state C any differently than it treats the product coming in from state A. To do so would be discriminatory, so state B can't put an additional or higher tariff on this particular product X. It can't be any higher than the tariff imposed on this product. And that ensures, if you like, fairness of access. State B cannot discriminate. And as a result, uh, we sometimes say that state B has extended most favored nation trading status to both countries A and C as a result of this agreement. The fourth uh, way of promoting trade is to put into place something called national treatment rules. Now, national treatment rules are really interesting because, of course, state B might produce product X itself. So what happens now? Is state B allowed to have special rules for its own product that might privilege it with respect to the products from state A and state C? And the whole idea is no. National treatment says that any product, uh, X in this case, coming from state A and state C, cannot be treated any differently than the domestically produced equivalent. So state B, for example, couldn't put additional safety rules or regulations on the product X from state A or the product X from state C. It would have to have the same safety rules for the products produced in its own country and on the products produced in other countries. National treatment. Everyone is treated the same. Fifth principle is reciprocity. And the whole idea of reciprocity is that in this arrangement, and of course there's countries trading back and forth and all sorts of products all the time, right, in this agreement, the principle of reciprocity says that in general, all countries should benefit. They may not benefit perfectly equally, but they should all benefit. And therefore, the trade agreement should be a reciprocal arrangement. Everyone should get benefit out of it. Finally, All trade agreements are characterized by exemptions, and these exemptions are negotiated by states. States may want to protect certain sectors of their economy. For example, cultural industries or agricultural products are fairly commonly protected under trade agreements like this one. And in that case, countries have negotiated ways to exempt those sectors from these broader rules. Now, extend all of this onto the global environment, and in the World Trade Organization, you have all of these principles and rules and practices being put into place. The same goes for regional trade agreements, like the North American Free Trade Agreement, for example, or the European Union, or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. 
It's also the case in bilateral trade agreements, where perhaps just two countries are engaging in a trade agreement with each other. The whole idea, then, is that free trade just doesn't happen. Free trade is built. It's based on negotiated agreements between states. Okay, so that was free trade. Now, what's really interesting about free trade is many people argue that it has an important political component. And the political component is peace. Now, this is really interesting because the idea is that the more free trade there is in the world, the more peaceful the world will become. Now, why is that? Well, the whole idea is if you promote more mutually beneficial exchange between countries, between peoples, they'll be less willing to go to war with one another. Because if you're increasingly interconnected and you're increasingly trading with one another, you've got an interest in peaceful relations. You want to keep up the trade relationship. And if you lose that, if you go to war, you'll be damaging your own interests. So many argue that free trade and a more peaceful world go hand in hand. That we'll have more prosperity because goods and resources are being produced and obtained more efficiently. And we'll have more peace because people will be more reluctant to go to war with one another. Put these two together and you have a very compelling argument for free trade. But of course many argue that free trade is not a panacea for peace. It won't necessarily produce peace. And many argue that the costs of free trade, that people will lose their incomes, lose their livelihoods, become exploited in this free trade world is too high a price to pay. I hope you enjoyed this video. Join me again next time. I'll see you later.